morning. <clears throat> Thank you, Katie Ann. Let's pray together, would we? Father, we're thankful for this moment today to stop and hear your word. Oh God, how we pray that in this Advent time we would be tuned in to your spirit. Lord, hearing from your word today, Lord, how you came and Lord, how you're coming again. Give us grace, especially as we consider ways that we wait on you. Teach us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I imagine many of you have vivid memories as a child of the anticipation of Christmas Day. My mom, bless her soul, every Thanksgiving would pull out the Advent calendar and she'd hang it right on the refrigerator. She still does this. You know, no other holiday, no other holiday has a countdown. But Christmas does. And as soon as that calendar came out, the clock began. A whole week until December. And then on December 1st, you can legally start opening those silly little doors to find out what's revealed hidden behind them. And by the way, this is way, way before the Godiva luxury chocolate advent calendars came out. You know, when it's like December 12th, and the calendar has just gone missing, right? <laughs> My calendar always had a shepherd, an angel, a star, a donkey, and 24 irritating days of waiting. <laughs> Most Advent calendars, they're designed, like mine, to tell a story. But for me, those calendars only underscored and mocked my obvious problem, and that's this. I hate to wait. I hate to wait. Most people hate to wait, and that's why most of you have already bought and opened your Christmas presents, right? My, my wife, Caroline, and I, we went to a concert two, two weeks ago. It was like $100 a ticket, and we're like, well, Merry Christmas to you and me. <laughs> so Caroline and I, we don't like to wait either. That's our society, isn't it? Uh, the instantaneous has basically become an American right. But isn't it the case that so much of what is praiseworthy, so much of what is lasting in this life, it needs, it necessitates the transformative qualities that come with time. Children don't magically mature overnight. Broken relationships, they don't mend on demand. Lasting healing doesn't get packaged in a, peel, in a pill. Job skills, they're not a direct download, except in the matrix. So I'd, I'd like us to consider the not-so-instant in life today. What is it that you just have to wait for? And I want you to consider that thing for a minute. You know, maybe it's a certain sports team winning their next four games so that they can make it into the playoffs. Maybe it's the next Spider-Man movie that's coming out next week. Maybe it's those blissful days of Christmas vacation. Or maybe it's a bit more significant than that, right? Maybe you're waiting this Christmas on important test results. Maybe you're waiting to foster a child or adopt a child, perhaps even conceive a child. Maybe you're waiting for that special someone to ask you out, pop the question, or maybe just get a clue. <laughs> maybe you're waiting for all of this COVID mess to just go away. Or maybe, maybe you're waiting for the salvation of a dear loved one. If you're breathing, you've probably said it lately. How long? How long, O oh Lord, must I wait? Well, today, we wait no longer to open a four-week series on the seven-mile Advent calendar. And through two texts from two very different time periods in Scripture, we're going to ask how Advent informs our waiting. And ready, and here's, here's the spoiler of all. Here's the spoiler. Advent teaches us the value of waiting on the Lord. Advent teaches us the value of waiting on the Lord. And we're going to talk about what that means, but first off, what is this thing, Advent? Christian Advent has to do, as you know, with the coming of the person of Jesus. Christian Advent is the stunning event, staggering event in human history of the God of the universe coming personally in the flesh to you and I to live among us. Advent has this rich, 
wonderful backstory, and it's loaded with waiting on the Lord. Our text from Isaiah, it jumps right into the middle of that backstory. We read Isaiah 7, 14, Katie Ann read it. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive, bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah 7, 14, famous Advent verse that has this extensive backstory. So let's meditate on it for a moment. The sign that God gives to Isaiah, written here in Isaiah 7, has these three marks. Keep these in mind. The virgin conceives. She gives birth to a son. The son's name will be Emmanuel, which when translated from Hebrew means God with us. And with these marks, God is expanding on a promise that he made much earlier in human history. Would you consider how this just one verse God is reminding his people that he never, ever will forget his promises. God keeps each and every one of them. Even a promise made thousands of years earlier. Well, what was that ancient promise? Well, to answer the question, we need to go back in time, step back to the very beginning. So Genesis chapter 3 for a moment. The scene is the Garden of Eden, Eden. God, Satan, Adam, Eve, there's this huge tension in the air. Because Adam and Eve have just been caught red-handed, right? They've given in to Satan's subtle temptation to sin. They've chosen to distrust God's goodness to them. And just like that, one act of disobedience, one act of disobedience to God, humankind is corrupted, and the advent of death begins. Now think about that. Think about the pandemic caused by our first parents' sinful choice. Death comes, and because of sin, it comes to everyone who ever will or has lived. Now, God, because he's God, he can look down the hall of human history, and he can see not only death, but the hellish separation from God that every one of Adam's offspring, including you and I, will experience. And if they're, it's right there in the midst of understanding that and seeing that, there in that, with this dreadful death sentence hanging over them, God sends a bright ray of hope. He gives a promise. The perfectly just the infinitely good God promises to rescue and restore wayward, weak, and wretched sinners like you and I. God says he'll do it. He says to Satan in Genesis 3, verse 15, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, consider this. It's a bit enigmatic, but consider that by the third chapter of the Bible, God promises that there will be one born who will have the power to crush the head of Satan. Now, who could possibly, who could possibly have that kind of power? Do you hear echoes of that ancient promise in our verse, Isaiah 7, 14? So let's return there. Let's return to 760 B.C. and the prophecy that the virgin will give birth and her offspring will be named God with us. Now, by Isaiah's time, there's been over 3,000 years of waiting for the offspring of the woman. 3,000 years. That's a long wait. God's people have grown tired. They're tired of waiting for Israel's deliverer. In fact, Israel at the time, if you read around the prophecy of Isaiah, you'll see that Israel was a people in crisis. They're plagued by ongoing civil unrest between the tribes. They're suffering through various environmental disasters. They're even tormented by persistent terroristic threats to the nation. The people of God began to doubt that God was with them. And Isaiah 30 records them saying this. Listen to what God, God's people said. They said, let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. Can you imagine saying that? Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. They're abandoning their hope in God. 
They're putting their hope instead in political powers of their day. Ironically, they're looking to Egypt, the very nation that once enslaved them. Now consider this for a moment. This is God's people. This is the people that possessed God's promises in writing, right? They have the law. They have the history. They have the prophets, right? They have the wisdom literature. This is the people who built a temple, a building where God would literally meet with them. This is the people who by Isaiah's time had experienced 3,000 years of God being with them, faithful to them. And they effectively said that the promised deliverer of Genesis 3 was not worth the wait any longer. They're bitter, they're full of doubts, and God's people began to compromise. We know that God didn't sit idly by, and just to say that Israel was soon taken into captivity, they were moved from the promised land, their physical exile from Jerusalem, from the promised land, it's a picture the picture that's fitting of their relational exile from the Lord. Well, I say that only to ask this question. How have you ever felt that God was far from you? Have you ever felt that God had turned a blind eye toward your suffering? Friend, if you find yourself today towing the ledge of doubt and unbelief, I want you to hear the word of the Lord here. It's filled with this one common refrain, and that's this. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Now, how are those words helpful in any way? Well, the prophet Isaiah went on to say to this dubious people, the people of God, he said this. This comes from Isaiah 40. He says, why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? And my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even you shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What an amazing account of who God is. Now, Isaiah is saying that waiting on the Lord is the way to renew your strength. Waiting on the Lord, it seizes hold of the only one, the only one who has infinite resources and infinite capability to make things happen. And in his doing so, restore your soul. Now notice this. Waiting on the Lord is not inaction. It's not inaction. In fact, I want to give you four ways that you can wait on the Lord during this season of Advent. And those four ways include a way of speaking, a way of being, a way of thinking, and a way of acting. So first, a way of speaking. As you wait, as you wait for whatever it is you're waiting for, take your deepest care to the Lord in prayer. Take your holy complaint to God. I put it that way. For a minute, because the Puritans used to distinguish between a holy complaint and a discontented complaint. A holy complaint is this. We bring our concerns to God. A discontented complaint grumbles about God. Got the difference? Taking your complaint to God as opposed to grumbling about God. The scripture is full of examples of saints crying out to God for help. And one of the most famous examples comes from Psalm 13. I want you to listen to the king, the king of Israel, King David himself. He says this, How long, Lord? How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? 
hear that. What exactly was David waiting on the Lord for here? He, he comes to the Lord concerned about his thoughts, his sorrow, his enemies. Which ones, which enemies, which thoughts? We don't know exactly. But I want us to let David's cry to the Lord, his holy complaint through the Psalms, shape your own prayers to God as you wait for whatever you're waiting for. The Psalms give voice to our emotions. They give voice to our groanings. Later, in Psalm 40, David will write another psalm, and he says this. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me. He heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. God comes through. God answers David's prayer. But how long it takes or how long it took, it's anyone's guess. You know, too often we want to give God a deadline. Pastor Tim Keller says this, God's sense of timing will confound ours, no matter what culture we come from. His grace rarely operates according to our schedule. Isn't that true? The Apostle Peter will say essentially the same thing. Peter says, do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. When God's answer isn't exactly when you expect it, or maybe when God's answer isn't exactly what you expect, the Lord isn't sleeping. The Lord isn't turning a deaf ear or a blind eye to your suffering. We've said this before, if we knew what the Lord knows, both about the present and the future, we'd likely be a lot more patient, a lot more humble, a lot more trusting. But what we do know is this, God has come through in the past. We can trust him as we wait because his track record is flawless. His promises never fail. And he, in fact, delights in proving to his people again and again that he is Emmanuel, God with us. Well, if you still have your Bible in your hands, would you turn to Luke 1, now, verses 26 through 38. We're going to fast forward almost 800 years from Isaiah's time, and we're going to enter a backwoods area of Israel called Galilee. There you'll find this obscure town named Nazareth, where a small-time teenage girl is about to receive the big-time fulfillment of a 4,000-year promise. The teen's engaged. The teen's a virgin, and her name is Mary. We don't know, we don't know anything really about Mary, Mary's life before she meets the angel Gabriel. Nothing about her being particularly special. No scripture memory awards. No resume for child care at the church. Nothing. In verse 28, Mary is told simply that the Lord is with her. Gabriel says that she's favored by God, literally graced by God. And then Gabriel, he delivers this 4,000-year-old package to Mary. God's gracious promise has literally come to her. Mary will bear a son, and his name will be Jesus, which translated means God saves. God saves. And after Gabriel drops this bomb, Mary waits nine months. Now, warning here, waiting on God's promises can sometimes cause a bit of bewilderment. This was true for ancient Israel, as we were just seeing, as they watched godless nations grow to this enormous power around them, nations that would pillage them, tend to take them out of Israel, wipe them from the face of earth, the earth. Israel, by the way, went from years of bewilderment to years of dis disillusionment, okay, wrongly thinking that God didn't see them or didn't care or wasn't keeping his promise. Well, consider now Mary. Consider her bewilderment as she has to deal with waiting. Specifically, how does an unwed teenager, how does she explain to her fiancé, her family, her village about her baby bump? We read in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, that Joseph, the fiancé, started planning to quietly break off the engagement. That had to be crushing. 
What's Mary going to say? You know, what is she going to say to make anyone understand? You know, it's okay. Don't freak out. God did this, right? Don't worry. Angel Gabriel told me that this child is going to be great. And by the way, he's the Holy One of Israel, the Son of God. I mean, what would you have thought if you were Mary's parents? And then she said this to you. It must have sounded ludicrous, preposterous. You know, it must have sounded blasphemous to some, scandalous. God's people were well aware at this point that God hadn't spoken for 400 years since the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi. Since when does God start dealing with Hicksville teenage girls? How would Mary explain this? Well, for Mary, waiting on the Lord for his vindication had to be bewildering. And if you were Mary, wouldn't you, I mean, wouldn't you have wanted the angel to come and just talk to every single person in town to let them know what was happening? Especially your parents. Or perhaps you'd want to know a little bit more about who this son of the Most High was going to be. And just maybe a little bit more about how you're supposed to care for him, the Son of God. I mean, truly, what child is this? You know, God had never wrapped himself in babiness before. Was this child going to be angelic? I mean, literally angelic? Would he take care of himself? Would he need to be taught? Do you nurse the Son of God? Is it true, as they say, that the little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes? Would the thought of God in diapers have messed with your theology? So many questions waiting to be answered. You know, and add to, that, add to that that small little detail about him being a king, right? The angel Gabriel said that this boy from Nazareth was going to take the throne of David and that that kingdom would have no end. Now, who in the right mind would even whisper the idea of ascending to the throne to be the king of the Jews in the midst of a Roman occupation where the penalty for resistance was crucifixion? Well... Just add a little bit more bewilderment, a little extra bewilderment. <laughs> Elizabeth, Mary's much older and barren relative, was going to give birth as well in her, whole, in her old age. I mean, how was all of this happening? So much about who this holy child was, Mary would simply just have to wonder and wait and trust in the God of the impossible. Mary's only question to Gabriel is recorded as this, how will this be since I am a virgin? That's a good question. Gabriel clears it up with a, in verse 35 here with a TED talk on Holy Spirit conception. And Mary's reply to Gabriel's short lesson is just absolutely astonishing to me. She simply says, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Wow, that's it. You know, maybe Mary hadn't fully processed everything in the moment. Maybe unrecorded in the scripture for us is this nine months of Mary bringing her holy complaint to God about this whole ordeal. I, I want to say, I imagine she prayed a lot in nine months. But at some point, like Mary, don't we all need to come to this humble, trusting place in our waiting and say, behold, I am the servant of the Lord let it be to me according to your word. Take a lesson from this teenage girl who demonstrates this holy waiting on the Lord. Mary teaches us a second way of how we wait well on the Lord. As we wait, um, she demonstrates a way of being. Like Mary, we wait well when we have this ongoing humble trust. And what that means is waiting on the Lord with humility and trust is you and me allowing God to choose the time and choose the way in which he's going to work, whether it's in us or through us or aside from us or in spite, of, in spite of us, we let God do it. Humble yourselves, the scripture says, under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Third, Mary's waiting also teaches us that we wait well when we think about this, that God himself waits. God himself waits. Now, right after our text here in Luke 1, 
uh, verses 46 and after that, is what's called Mary's Song. And I encourage you to read it sometime during Advent. It's wonderful. I want to draw your attention to one short verse out of it. Mary sings this. She says, God has helped his servant Israel. Think what she's saying. God has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers. Now, Mary knows her Bible. This teenage girl knows her Bible. She sees how a 4,000-year-old promise was being fulfilled in the coming of Jesus. It took 4,000 years, though. Consider that. Consider that. God felt no compulsion to rush to earth to rescue Adam and Eve from sin and shame and Satan and death. God promised. He promised his coming and his deliverance to our forefathers. And then he waited. God himself waits. So if we return just once more down back to Isaiah in 8th century B.C., Isaiah says this in Isaiah 30. He says, the Lord waits to be gracious to you. The Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you, for the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. You know, God waits in order to show you grace. He waits to show his grace. He waits so that more and more of the world might receive him as their king. Apostle Peter said something similar when he said this, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And then, according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation. Fascinating words here. Well, here Peter is talking about God's patience and the second coming of Jesus. And in the same letter, Peter will say that Jesus will come like a thief in the night. And Jesus himself, right at the end of the Bible, will say, Behold, I'm coming quickly. But 2,000 years later, 2,000 years later now, we know that God waits His timing is not like ours, and he waits with a purpose. Friends, this Christmas, you may be waiting for many good and wonderful things to happen, but the most significant thing right now, on December 12th, 2021, the most significant thing about today is that Jesus has not come back yet. Jesus hasn't come back yet. Today, friend, if you know Jesus, if you, sorry, friend, if you don't know Jesus, God's waiting is his gift to you this Christmas. This is the day of his favor. Would you, as the Christmas hymn says, prepare room for for him in your heart? Prepare room for him in your heart. Would you turn from your sin, turn to the one who delivers you from the guilt of sin and the pains of eternal death? Receive the one, the only one, who can bring lasting joy to your longing heart. Now, brother and sister in Christ, God's waiting is also a gift to you and I as his people. We've got a lot of maturing to do, don't we? No, some of us more than others. We've got a lot of maturing to do before we meet the Lord. We have plenty of rough spots to be worked out of our old nature. And this is why Peter said to the church this, Why we are waiting for the new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells, be diligent to be found in him without spot or blemish and at peace. You know, our sinful nature, the world, and Satan, they form like an unholy trinity that wants nothing of us waiting on the prince of peace. And this leads us to the fourth way to wait well on the Lord. We've seen a way of speaking. We've seen seen a way of being. We've seen a way of thinking and remembering that God is a God who waits. Lastly, we'll consider a way of acting as we wait on the Lord. And that is this. We wait well when we resist 
compromise. Now, as Peter says, we are diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Now, what does this mean? It means this. When your sinful nature grows discontent and urges you to give in to whatever that thing is, resist. Resist. When the world's counterfeit pleasures gives you that all-you-can-eat buffet we were praying about earlier, When that world's counterfeit pleasures tempt you to indulge in whatever that thing is, resist. When Satan himself schemes against you, entices you to doubt the Lord, his goodness, for whatever reason it is, resist. Resist compromise. Even today, even today, you and I may have convinced ourselves to wait for something that will not bring peace between you and the Lord. That thing will never bring you peace because it's asking you to com- compromise commitment to the Lord in some way. So I say resist. Resist moral compromise. It's, the essential, it's an essential way to wait on the Lord. It's also a way to build spiritual muscle. Uh, Pastor Paul Tripp said it like this. He said, waiting always presents me with a spiritual choice point. Will I allow myself to question God's goodness and progressively grow weaker in faith? Or will I embrace the opportunity of faith that God is giving me and build my spiritual muscles? You know, when we resist the flesh, when we resist the world, when we resist the devil, it's like joining God's gym. Right? Have you looked at yourself lately? Your spiritual self? Have you considered your spiritual muscles? Resist moral compromise and you will grow fit for heaven. Now listen to this. We're going to go to another century here. 17th century, southern France. Teenage girl named Marie Durant. She's brought in before authorities. She's charged with being a Protestant Christian. All she had to do to be released was say, Je jure, which meant that she would recant her belief that a person could actually have a Bible and read it for themselves. Now, Marie Durant... Marie Durant refused, and together with 30 other French Protestants, Huguenots, women at that, she was locked up with these women in a stone tower by the sea for 38 years. 38 years. Now, instead of renouncing her faith, she ministered to her fellow prisoners and to anyone else that she could even write to on the outside. Marie and the prisoners, in their time, they etched one word, on their prison tower wall. That one word was this, resiste, resist. And you can still see it uh, in the stone wall today. Resist. Now imagine waiting 38 years in a stone tower, resisting compromise because of your commitment and your devotion to God. And one author who writes about Marie Durant, he offers us these thoughts. And it's a little long, but listen in. We do not, he says this, we do not understand the terrifying simplicity of a religious commitment which asks nothing of time and gets nothing from time. We can understand a religion which enhances time, but we cannot understand a faith which is not nourished by the temporal hope that tomorrow things will be better. To sit in a prison room with 30 others and to see the day change into night and summer into autumn to feel the slow systemic changes within one's flesh, the drying and wrinkling of the skin, the loss of muscle tone, the stiffening of the joints, the slow stupefaction of the senses, to feel all this and still to persevere seems almost idiotic to a generation that has no capacity to wait and endure. Some powerful words there. Brothers and sisters, this Advent, what is your capacity to endure as you wait. Are your spiritual muscles weak? Are they strong? Are your senses stupefying? Are they alert? Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. The Lord will renew your strength. You will mount up with wings, Isaiah says, like eagles. You will run and not be weary. You will walk and not faint. Take your holy complaint to God. Humbly trust in him. Remind yourself that he is a God, too, who waits with purpose and resists moral compromise. You know, today, 
God's advent calendar tells us that Jesus has come. And he is coming again. The day is not written on a calendar in a month, day, and year. But his coming again is written in a promise. Emmanuel will come. Never too late. Never too early. He arrives precisely when he means to. Now, does that kind of waiting seem idiotic? I hope not. Not when we know that the kind of person Emmanuel is. Not when we remember what he has done. And not when we are filled with the hope of all that he is planning to do at the dawn of his next advent. Amen? Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, teach teach us to wait well on you. Lord, there are ways that we, we wait, and there are for all the wrong reasons, for all the wrong things. And if that's the case, would you give us grace to repent? And Lord, there are ways that we are waiting, waiting for the right things. And would you give us, in this time of waiting, grace to trust and worship and obey? Lord, I think of the hymn writer who says, Come, thou long-expected Jesus, born to set your people free from our fears and sins release us let us find our rest in thee you are Israel's strength and Israel's consolation you are the hope of all the earth you are the desire of every nation you are the joy of every longing heart thank you Jesus you are our Emmanuel you are our God with us amen